Discretion is advised. And both campaigns have agreed the candidates will not shake hands at the beginning of tonight's debate. The audience here in the hall has promised to remain silent. No cheers, no boos or other interruptions so we, and more importantly you, can focus on what the candidates have to say. No noise except right now as we welcome the Republican nominee, President Trump, and the Democratic nominee, Vice President Biden. Gentlemen, a lot of people have been waiting for this night, so let's get going. Our first subject is the Supreme Court. President Trump, you nominated Amy Coney Barrett over the weekend to succeed the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the court. You say the Constitution is clear about your obligation and the Senate's to consider a nominee to the court. Vice President Biden, you say that this is an effort by the President and Republicans to jam through an appointment and what you call an abuse of power. My first question to both of you tonight, why are you right in the argument you make and your opponent wrong, and where do you think a Justice Barrett would take the court? President Trump, in this first segment, you go first, two minutes. Thank you very much, Chris. I will tell you very simply, we won the election. Elections have consequences. We have the Senate, we have the White House, and we have a phenomenal nominee, respected by all, top, top academic, uh, good in every way, good in every way. In fact, uh, some of her biggest endorsers are very liberal people from Notre Dame and other places. So I think she's going to be fantastic. We have plenty of time, uh, even if we did it after the election itself. I have a lot of time after the election, as you know. So I think that uh, she will be outstanding. She's going to be uh, as good as anybody that has served on that court. We really feel that. Uh, we have a professor at Notre Dame, highly respected by all, said she's the single greatest student he's ever had. He's been a professor for a long time at a great school. And uh, we just, uh, we won the election, and therefore we have the right to choose her. And very few people knowingly would say otherwise. And by the way, the Democrats, they wouldn't even think about not doing it. If they had, the only difference is to try and do it faster. There's no way they would give it up. They had Merritt Garland, but the problem is they didn't have the election, so they were stopped. And probably that would happen in reverse also. Definitely would happen in reverse. So we won the election, and we have the right to do it, Chris. President Trump, thank you. Um, same question to you, Vice President Biden. You have two minutes. Well, first of all, um, thank you for doing this, and looking thank forward you. to this, Mr. President. Thank you, Joe. I, uh, the American people have a right to have a say in who the Supreme Court nominee is. And that say occurs when they vote for a United States senators and when they vote for the President of the United States. They're not going to get that chance now because we're in the middle of an election already. The election has already started. Tens of thousands of people have already voted. And so the thing that should happen is we should wait. We should wait and see what the outcome of this election is, because that's the only way the American people get to express their view is by who they elect as president and who they elect as vice president. Now, what's at stake here is the president's made it clear he wants to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. He's been running on that, he ran on that, and he has been governing on that. He's in the Supreme Court right now trying to get rid of uh, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, which uh, will strip 20 million people from having insurance, health insurance now, if it, if they, if it goes into court. And, and uh, the justice, and I have nothing, I'm not opposed to the justice, she seems like a very fine person. But she's written before she went in the bench, which is her right, that she thinks that the Affordable Care Act is not constitutional. The other thing that's on the court, and if, if, if it's struck down, what happens? Women's rights are fundamentally changed. Once again, a woman could be helped pay more money because she has a pre-existing condition of pregnancy. We were able to, they were able to charge a woman more for the same exact procedure a man did, gets. And that ended when we, in fact, passed the Affordable Care Act. And there's 100 million people who have pre-existing conditions, and they'll be taken away as well. 
those pre-existing conditions, the insurance companies are going to love this. And so it's just not appropriate to do this before this election. If he wins the election and the Senate is Democrat or Republican, then it, he goes forward. If not, we should wait until February. All right. There aren't 100 million people with pre-existing conditions. As far as the say is concerned, the people already had their say. They — okay, Justice Ginsburg said very powerfully, very strongly, at some point, 10 years ago or so, she said a president and the Senate is elected for a period of time. But a president's elected for four years. We're not elected for three years. I'm not elected for three years. So we have the Senate. We have a president. He's elected to the next During election. that period of time, during that period of time, we have an opening. I'm not elected for three years. I'm elected for four years. Well, thank you very much. And hello, Kenosha. It's nice to be back. It's nice to be back. We spent a little time with you, a little law and order. We brought law and order to Kenosha. Right? That's what we want. And hello, Wisconsin. Big day tomorrow. Big, big day. Big day. And I think we're going to do very well in Wisconsin, just like we did four years ago. And it's an honor to be with you. Thank you. And this is a lot of people. This is a lot of people. See, you know what that means? That means we don't have to pay for the microphones because they did a bad job. Tomorrow, we are going to win this state, and we are going to win four more years in the White House. And with your vote, we will continue to cut your taxes, cut regulations, support our police, support our great military, protect your Second Amendment. It's under siege, but don't worry about it. Unless Sleepy Joe got in, then you can forget about your Second Amendment. Defend religious liberty and ensure more products are proudly stamped with that beautiful phrase, made in the USA. Next year, we will be — and, you know, we're going to be together next year. We're going to be together for four more years, and we're going to be together forever, because we're doing things that nobody's ever done, and we're doing them together. Hello. Hello. My fellow Americans and the People who brought me the dance, Delawareans. I see my buddy, Tom, Senator Tom Carper down there, and I think, I think Senator Coons is there, and I think the governor's around. And is that Ruth Ann? And that former Governor Ruth Ann Minner. Most importantly, my sisters-in-law and my sister Valerie. Anyway. Folks. The people of this nation have spoken. They've delivered us a clear victory, a convincing victory, a victory for we, the people. We've won with the most votes ever cast from presidential ticket in the history of the nation, 74 million. What I must admit has surprised me Tonight, we're seeing all over this nation, all cities and all parts of the country, indeed across the world, an outpouring of joy, of hope, renewed faith, and tomorrow, bring a better day. And I'm humbled by the trust and confidence you've placed in me. I pledge to be a president who seeks not to divide, but unify who doesn't see red states and blue states, only sees the United States. And work with all my heart, with the confidence of the whole people, to win the confidence of all of you. And for that is what America, I believe, is about. It's about people. And that's what our administration will be all about. I sought this office to restore the soul of America, 
to rebuild the backbone of this nation, the middle class, and to make America respected around the world again. And to unite us here at home. It's the honor of my lifetime that so many millions of Americans have voted for that vision. And now, the work of making that vision is real. It's a task, the task, of our time. Folks, as I said many times before, I'm Jill's husband. And I would not be here without her love and tireless support of Jill and my son, Hunter, and Ashley, my daughter, and all our grandchildren, and their spouses, and all our family. They're my heart. Jill's a mom, a military mom, an educator, and she has dedicated her life to education. But teaching isn't just what she does, it's who she is. For American educators, this is a great day for y'all. You are such a in the tightly contested state of Florida, emotions are running high. Vote for Trump like true Americans. Want socialism, move to Cuba. Trump and Biden went head to head here. So too did their supporters. We've been getting middle finger stuff thrown at us all, all for the past hour and a half that we've been here. If Joe Biden wins Florida in the election, not gonna, but will you accept it? A president of the United States is America. We're supposed to. But guess what? It's not going to happen. What do you say to people who say you're being intimidating, you should let people have a choice? I mean, everybody has the right to choice. Everybody, everybody. Again, the people that were at the Biden rally today, when we seen them, hi, how you doing? Who's the losers now? Who's Trump fans are unwelcome guests at a Biden rally. At times, aggravation sparks confrontation. One of the Trump supporters said that you spat on him. That what? That you spat on him. He kept coming in our car and we told him not to. We had to do something to get him away. Do you feel sad that this is what it's come down to? Oh, absolutely. It didn't this, have to be this This is way. not going to be the worst. You think it's going to get worse? When Biden wins next week, Trump's going to say it was rigged and he's going to tell all of his people that, you know, have guns to go out and start uh, protecting their liberty. My president is a racist. Donald Trump, Trump is not a racist. If you ever wonder just how bitter this fight has become, this is a prime example. We're just days away from the election, and in tight states like this, the tension's continuing to rise. This is democracy in America, but compromise and compassion seem in short supply. A dangerous trend when in just days, one side is expected to accept defeat. Siobhan Robbins, Sky News in Florida. Hello, Toledo. This feels like coming home. Well, I tell you what, I, uh, my dad was an automobile man. I got through, uh, school and we got through uh, being able to eat after we lost a job up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He had moved down to Delaware because uh, because it's selling General Motors products. And so uh, I've known in my state used to have the largest percentage of auto workers of any state in the nation because we had a small population and the largest General Motors and largest Chrysler plant outside of Michigan and and uh, Ohio. And uh, I saw, I saw what happened when we got hit very hard. We've lost both those plants. Well, let me start off by saying, Mr. Mayor, thanks for the passport into your city. And Marcy, you've been a friend a long time. Thank you for your introduction. You know, there's no more fierce defender. There's no more fierce defender the people she grew up with than Marcy. She has never, ever, ever forgotten where she came from. She's tough. She shoots. She's a straight shooter. She's influential in Congress. She's honest, and she sees you. You're always in her view. And Tony, Mr. President, I know you're new, and he said, piece of cake, so I don't have to worry if I get elected the first 100 days. Uh, 
But all kidding aside, Tony, thank you for hosting us, and thank you for Local 14. And Kenyatta, you, uh, thanks for that introduction. All you did for Barack and me when we were running, when we got elected, jumping in and being part of helping us govern, you remind me of something my dad said. He said, Joey, a job's about a lot more than a paycheck. It's about your dignity. It's about your place in the community. It's about respect. It's about being able to say to your kid and look him in the eye and say, everything's going to be OK and mean it. That's what job's about. A decent paying job like the UAW provides. This lesson I grew up with, surrounded by hardworking families in Scranton and then in Claymont, Delaware, where we had to move when dad lost work. There was no work in Scranton. Just like here in Toledo. But the times are hard. Unemployment is way up due to the pandemic and the terrible way in which it's been handled. The economic outlook remains uncertain. Across Ohio and the country, folks are worried about making the next mortgage payment or the rent payment, whether or not they can purchase their prescription drugs or be able to put food on the table, literally. The President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. Please sir. thank you. This is without question the latest news conference I've ever had. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. And I want to thank the American people for their tremendous support. Millions and millions of people voted for us tonight. And uh, a very sad group of people is trying to disenfranchise that group of people. And we won't stand for it. We will not stand for it. I want to thank the First Lady, my entire family, and Vice President Pence, Mrs. Pence, for being with us all through this. And we were getting ready for a big celebration. We, we were winning everything, and all of a sudden, it was just called off. The results tonight have been phenomenal, and we are getting ready. I mean, literally, we were just all set to get outside and just celebrate something that was so beautiful, so good, uh, such a vote, such a success. The citizens of this country have come out in record numbers. This is a record. There's never been anything like it to support our incredible movement. We won states that we weren't expected to win. Florida, we didn't win it. We won it by a lot. And he was playing golf. The word we have is that he was playing golf when, when it happened. And this is some video of the president out playing golf. And the, when the network started calling it, I think CNN went first, and then sort of everybody called it all at once, and then Fox called it maybe. 30 minutes later or so, something like that. And then everybody's just been kind of watching this all day. But the president heard while he was on the golf course, stayed on the golf course, we're told. Uh, we don't know anything about how the golf, there he goes. And then uh, we have some pictures of him when he arrived back at the White House. You saw that scene there, thousands and thousands of people out cheering. Well, he drove past that on the way. And that's a photo that will, you know, that'll probably be one that lives for a while. Uh, as he was going back in, uh, 45 of... Uh, President Trump, the 45th president of the United States, going back into the White House. We've heard a little from him since then, but not a whole lot. CBC's Kayla Tausche is in Washington following the president. President Trump and his campaign have filed a number of lawsuits against key battleground states. These legal actions come as Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden now leads in several of those crucial states. Legal challenges in Georgia and Michigan have already been thrown out because of a lack of evidence. The Trump campaign had attempted to stop the vote count due to allegations of fraudulent activity. In a statement this morning, the president's campaign said, quote, this election is not over. The false projection 
nomination of Joe Biden as the winner is based on results in four states that are far from final. They allege, without evidence, ballots were improperly harvested in Georgia, there have been irregularities in Pennsylvania, and thousands of mail-in ballots have been improperly cast in Nevada. Vice President Joe Biden currently holds a slim lead in all three of those states. Joining me now is Vanita Gupta. She is the president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and the former head of the U.S. Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division during the Obama administration. Vanita, welcome. Great to have you with us. So former Vice President Joe Biden has taken a slim lead in Pennsylvania. He's now one step closer to obtaining those 270 electoral votes needed. How likely are we to see the results get contested in Pennsylvania, and what would that look like? Well, uh, the Trump litigation strategy at this point has really been a distraction uh, to disrupt the typical counting that local election officials are doing. We should feel really heartened by uh, our local election officials around the country who, regardless of all of the noise, have been continuing to do their jobs. The voters have spoken. Uh, it is not likely that any litigation strategy is going to upend uh, the vote counting or the fact that the will of the American people um, has been expressed throughout this election season. I think it's really important to note that the Trump campaign seems to know that it is losing and is therefore filing these lawsuits that are baseless and meritless around the country has been met with court decisions that have uh, rejected their claims over the last 48 hours. And it sows a kind of a false narrative that seems pretty specifically designed to sow discord and suspicion about the results when actually local election officials of both parties are just doing their jobs. We should be grateful to them. They are counting the votes. They are exercising uh, and implementing our democratic norms and principles. And it is unlikely that litigation uh, or that the courts are going to be the deciding the outcome here. It's the voters that will decide. My fellow Americans, now let me introduce to you, for the first time, your next Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Kamala, the floor is yours. There you go. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. As I said, Joe, when you called me, I am incredibly honored by this responsibility, and I'm ready to get to work. I am ready to get to work. After the most competitive primary in history, the country received a resounding message that Joe was the person to lead us forward. And Joe, I'm so proud to stand with you. And I do so mindful of all the heroic and ambitious women before me whose sacrifice, determination, and resilience makes my presence here today even possible. This is a moment of real consequence for America. Everything we care about our economy, our health, our children, the kind of country we live in. It's all on the line. We're reeling from the worst public health crisis in a century. The president's mismanagement of the pandemic has plunged us into the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. And we're experiencing a moral reckoning with racism and systemic injustice that has brought a new coalition of conscience to the streets of our country demanding change. America is crying out for leadership. Yet we have a president who cares more about himself than the people who elected him. A president who is making every challenge we face even more difficult to solve. But here's the good news. We don't have to accept the failed government of Donald Trump and Mike Pence. In just 83 days, we have a chance to choose a better future.
for our country. So, Joe, Dr. Biden, thank you for the trust you've placed in me. Jill, I know you will be an incredible first lady. And my husband, Doug, and I are so grateful, grateful to become a part of your extended family. And ever since I received Joe's call, I've been thinking, yes, about the first Biden that I really came to know, and that, of course, is Joe's beloved son, one of his beloved sons, Bo. In the midst of the Great Recession, Bo and I spoke on the phone practically every day, sometimes multiple times a day, working together to win back billions of dollars for homeowners from the big banks of the nation that were foreclosing on people's homes. And let me just tell you about Bo Biden. I learned quickly that Bo was the kind of guy who inspired people to be a better version of themselves. He really was the best of us. And when I would ask him, where did you get that? Where did this come from? He'd always talk about his dad. And I will tell you, the love that they shared was incredible to watch. It was the most beautiful display of the love between a father and a son. And Bo talked about how Joe would spend four hours every day riding the rails back and forth from Wilmington to Washington so he could make breakfast for his kids in the morning and make it home in time to tuck them in bed each night. All of this, so two little boys who had just lost their mom and their sister in a tragic accident would know that the world was still turning. And that's how I came to know Joe. He's someone whose first response when things get tough is never to think about himself, but to care for everyone else. He's someone who never asks, why is this happening to me? And instead asks, what can I do to make life better for you? His empathy, his compassion, his sense of duty to care for others is why I am so proud to be on this ticket. <laughs>